And uh, it's a little bit early here, but uh, again, this is a good way to start the day to have a discussion with the audience today about the issue of lignin that has become actually very important uh, subject of research and development, especially recently. And uh, some of you who know what I do, uh, probably you know that uh, my favorite uh, materials are cellulose and chitin. I work uh, very heavily in cellulose and chitin nanomaterials. But also on lignin, even though I'm not a lignin chemist, uh, I will focus today uh, I'll, to share my experience with lignin from the point of view of uh, colloids and surface sciences. But again, this is not my work. This is the work of uh, my students uh, together with uh, our collaborators across uh, the globe. And uh, I will be summarizing the work for probably uh, uh, last five years, not all, but some of the work that we have been doing uh, with the researchers that you can read on the left of the screen, belonging to the different institutions across the planet, uh, including Finland, uh, Canada, um, and also uh, Austria, and many other institutions uh, that uh, really are very interested in looking into lignin, lignin valorization. And of course, I acknowledge the funding support uh, from the NSERC, the ERC in Europe, and the North Force that was uh, actually um, a development that specifically funded work in our group with, in relation. And finally, acknowledge the Bioproducts Institute uh, that I direct in the University of British Columbia and also the uh, Fin Series flagship in Finland. So, when we talk about uh, lignin, I thought it's important to put this into context. Uh, lignin hasn't been really the favorite in science and research in our area of uh, forest bioproducts. It has been mostly cellulose. And uh, at the beginning, I was alluding to that fact. But really, cellulose is coming very strong. And I think there are great opportunities for lignin as a um, renewable bio macro molecule. And of course, you all know that uh, lignin is a very complex uh, system uh, that uh, in the native form, it has a very um, complicated uh, three-dimensional structure in the tree. And that uh, is it, it, it is very difficult to define the molecular structure of uh, lignin when it's, it, it's separated, is fractionated. And uh, that leads to a lot of discussions about the true structure of uh, lignin. And in this uh, image that you see here in this slide, you can appreciate uh, recent work together with uh, Professor Balakshin related to the discussion whether lignin is a linear or a branch uh, macromolecule. So it's interesting that this discussion still is uh, going on. And this really allow us to go deeper into the science of the structure of lignin. But no question that lignin is coming back very strongly. And on the left, I include another paper that we published related to the topic. And, and you are welcome to, to come to that paper because it places lignin in the context of the future biorefineries. One additional comment as, as we start is uh, looking at the patents and publications uh, per year in the subject. So in this uh, busy slide, you can see on the right, uh, as a function of the number of years since 1990, how the publications in the area of uh, polysaccharides and nanomaterials, especially forest-based nanomaterials, has been growing very rapidly, as well as uh, proteins and also polyphenols. And in polyphenols, we have included uh, lignin uh, in uh, the orange color. And here we have patents publications uh, that will be in solid lines and uh, uh, the uh, publications themselves in broken lines. So it's interesting to see how the pace of uh, production of uh, publications and patent interest has been growing for lignin, but especially you can notice in 2010 or around uh, 2005, 2010, there has been a, a, a shift in the slope of uh, publications and, and patents related to lignin. So that signals to the recent interest in the last probably 10 years or so 
on a lignin that has been studied very heavily in the past, but I think it's uh, coming back very strongly. And of course, there are reasons for this. So I will share with you my perspective of lignin. From the point of view that uh, I propose lignin and its use um, with little or no deconstruction. So we try to reduce the steps to um, crack the lignin molecule to, to reduce the molecule to the building units of uh, the molecule. And rather to try to look into supramolecular assemblies of these structures. And this is very important in the case of lignin because of the polyaromatic structure and the different uh, substitutions that enable a highly heterogeneous uh, polarity distribution. And, and for that reason, this polyaromatic uh, molecule can act as an adhesive in a, in a wide variety of surfaces. Also, the effect of highly non-specific uh, uh, interactions. So overall, uh, lignin as a polyaromatic molecule can undergo not only hydrogen bonding, but uh, pi-pi interactions, uh, pi-cation uh, electrostatic, as well as uh, uh, hydrophobic interactions, of course, besides uh, typical van der Waals forces. And th that means that lignin can be virtually uh, interact with many different molecules in nature. And for that reason, of course, there are opportunities for the exploitation of such features in the macro in this macromolecule. So in the tree, lignin offers a water resistance and that also helps in the transport of water and the transport of uh, nutrients. Lignin uh, acts as a support, as a mechanical support and to resist the stresses, adds rigidity to the plant and resistance to rot, also antibacterial attack, fiber retardancy and has antioxidant activity. So it is natural, therefore, that some of the uses of lignin involve exactly those properties that lignin has in the plants. And before we continue to look into the supramolecular uh, construction of lignin um, uh, based uh, materials, I think it's important for us to think about the history, where the lignin comes from, how it is extracted. And if we take a look at a cross section of wood and imagine that the wood is being then subject to digestion, to cooking, to remove lignin, one thing that we can need to keep in mind is that lignin is removed at the beginning mostly from the secondary wall that is shown there in red. And the lignin molecules that are um, uh, located in the middle lamella come out later in the uh, later stages of the lignification of wood. That's shown on the right diagram where the percent delignification versus uh, the um, uh, wood, the delignification of the whole wood is uh, shown. And, and then here we can see a little bit about this uh, uh, topochemical um, evolution in the lignin removal. And that makes me think that when we remove lignin with time, as we collect the lignin in the so-called black liquor, different molecules are being uh, accumulated in the solution. And those molecules coming from different areas of the plant, uh, of the cell wall and the middle lamella, may have a different composition, different molecular weight. So one question is, how is that distribution of uh, chemical features change as we extract the molecule? And whether there is a relationship between molecular um, uh, uh, fingerprints and uh, um, degree of polymerization of the molecule, as well as the type of functional groups that exist in the molecule. And long time ago, that was maybe 2040, 2005, um, uh, I, I started to look at, into, into this uh, question and uh, we took uh, black liquors and different types of lignin solutions. But this, in this particular case, I refer to uh, black liquors from soda pulping of bagas. And what you see here is by using uh, ceramic um, uh, ultrafiltration membranes, we separate lignin molecules of different molecular weight uh, cut off, uh, depending on the membrane type, um, from the black liquor. And you can see those uh, solutions in the bottom with different color from a typical process. 
Now, if we take each of those fractions coming from the black liquor that is accumulated after time, we can also look into properties like the surface tension. And that's what I show here on the right. And immediately it, it emerges uh, to your eyes, the very fact that the molecular uh, weight or degree of polymerization of the lignin will affect the surface tension. So the surface activity that, and that would be one of the first messages that I want to share, that lignin is a surface active molecule, reduces the surface tension of water. So in this plot of surface tension uh, uh, in millinewtons per meter versus lignin concentration, we see that reduction. And that reduction in surface tension depends on the molecular weight cutoff fraction that was separated from the black liquid. Then when we take a look at each of those fractions as a function of molecular weight, and uh, we measure the amount of carboxylic groups and aliphatic OH, as well as other fingerprints that can be accessed by NMR, then it emerges the fact that uh, there is a relationship between those molecular fingerprints and uh, functionalities with the molecular weight. So in other words, we are separating the lignin molecule from the tree, but at the same time, selectively producing a correlation between molecular weight and functional groups. And perhaps that relates to the topochemistry that is where the lignin was sitting before extraction. This is of course something that needs uh, to be proved, but at least is an appealing idea. So going back to the surface uh, activity of lignin, this is also shown here how the lignin considered as a polymeric surfactant reduces surface tension. And uh, this is comparable to some typical surfactants that you see in the same uh, plot. So one aspect here of a typical surfactant is the appearance of a critical micelle concentrations, a, a, a break in the tendency of surface tension at a given concentration. And this is due to the association of the molecule in this particular case in water. And what you notice is that for, for lignin solutions, there is also a pseudo CMC. There is a change in the slope of the surface tension. And that signals that a given concentration lignin in solution starts to aggregate to form associative structures that are pretty dynamic. And I became very interested in this topic and also some time ago uh, uh, from this uh, paper from Nogren uh, published in Larmuir, there was some discussion about the complex colloidal behavior of uh, lignin in the form of the uh, fractal structures that it forms in solution. So it's a beautiful um, uh, case study for colloid chemistry working in the area to think about lignin as a molecule that first reduces surface tension and second associates in solution in uh, very interesting structures that are highly dynamic. So, so far, what we have discussed is an, a possible evidence of an a special, a special temporal memory of the lignin that is free from the plant during the cooking process. Now, the question that emerges or comes next is if what we concentrate now in our attention is on the fiber that we separate or the fibers that are separated in the same process, if there is also any correlation with the residual lignin that stays with the fibers. Not the one that is solubilized, but the one that stays with the fibers. So this really prompted some uh, interest in uh, more recent times in, in my group to look at uh, a lignin that is produced uh, from a single cook, single digestion of uh, wood, woody biomass, and to look at a given point during the process, uh, how first the black liquor uh, composition is, and more importantly, what is the composition of the fibers. So at a given point, a given so-called kappa number, the fibers are separated. Those fibers contain still large quantities of lignin. And then to subject the fibers to microfluidization so that we can produce uh, nanocellulose. And, and an interest in our group is to produce ligno nanocellulose, that is lignin containing nanocellulose, that is a very special type of nanomaterial that I think has very uh, high interest in many different applications. So this is what we did. We took the nanocellulose suspensions that were separated from this uh, exercise 
And we fractionated the fibrils uh, by size. And here you can see fibrils that are coarse, medium size, and the finest fibrils in terms of the width of the fibrils that are separated in this case by um, centrifugal fractionation. So using multi-stage fractionation. When we look at the fibrils, if we start with the coarse ones, of course, what you see on the left is the morphology in the AFM, as well as a plain view of a nanopaper or graphene that is produced with those fibrils containing lignin and a cross section. As you can see here, of course, this is a, a relatively thick uh, fibrils and, um, and um, uh, the typical diameter here we're talking about is about 17 nanometers. The lignin content is 15% and the apparent molecular weight is uh, 9,000. I want to uh, just highlight that this molecular weight is an apparent uh, molecular weight. It cannot be taken as an, as an absolute value. This is a, a, a challenge to measure, but we can take it as a, on a relative basis. When we look at the medium fibril size, of course, then we have a reduced fibril width. And that means that the aspect ratio of the fibrils is increased. So we have uh, finer fibrils. Uh, you can appreciate those in the AFM on the left, in the bottom, as well as the plain view of the nanopaper or film that is produced, as well as the cross section. And for the finest fibrils, of course, then we have even further reduced uh, diameter of the fibrils and more compact and densified paper. The molecular weight, as you can also see, actually is changing and uh, uh, increases as we have uh, uh, finer fibrils. So it's a very interesting proposition that there is also possibly here an effect of the uh, topology of the lignin and the fibril that it uh, is uh, bound to in such a way that is a, there is a correlation between fibril size and lignin concentration and molecular weight. Note that the lignin concentration is evolving from 50% in the coarse fibrils down to 25%. Uh, so there is a larger accumulation of the fibrils in the finer uh, fibers. So it looks like residual lignin and the properties as far as the concentration and molecular weight tracks with the fibril size. This is, uh, I think, very important and allow us to think about engineering materials using uh, different uh, nanocelluloses uh, containing uh, lignin. And those nanocelluloses can be used for many objectives. And one example that we use was as a coating for paper. In this particular case, the lignocellulose nanofibrils, LCNF, were used in such uh, um, uh, applications and provide really very nice uh, improvement in different properties in the printing, uh, printing process. And I don't want to discuss this in, in, in going into much detail. There is a, a, a lot still to be discussed, but it's here, what I want to mention here just simply is that this offers an opportunity, of course, in coating and surface modification. Let me go back a little bit about the surface activity of uh, lignin and uh, let's uh, think about uh, acetylating the lignin molecule. And here, what we did was to acetylate the lignin to uh, uh, change the balance of hydrophobicity, hydrophilicity of uh, the molecule. The lignin as a structure is a hydrophilic molecule. We always uh, say that uh, lignin is hydrophobic. Yeah, it is hydrophobic compared to or less hydrophilic compared to cellulose in the tree is a, a hydrophobic molecule, but once it, it is separated, it's a hydrophilic molecule uh, that can be solubilized in water. So for that reason, we wanted to add some hydrophobe groups to the molecule and to look at the phase behavior of the lignin molecule, the a technical lignin in this particular case. And what you see in this slide on the right is a, a, a uh, water phase in the bottom, in the top phase, uh, an, an oil. And then you can um, visualize where the lignin is located because of the uh, uh, color. And then you can imagine on the top that lignin is mainly in the water phase. But as we increase in the particular case on the top, uh, the salt concentration, the lignin is going to be pushed up to the oil phase. So there is a transition from um, the water phase to the oil phase in the lignin, and that points to the possibility of using lignin as a typical surfactant in emulsification processes. 
And, and, and that I think is very important because then, of course, one can think about the utilization of uh, lignin in a diverse spectrum of uh, emulsions. So some time ago, we looked into lignin to produce a fuel emulsions, in this particular case, oil and water emulsions, but keep in mind that a modified lignin, the way I explained earlier, can be also suitable for producing inverse emulsions. That, that will be water in uh, oil emulsions, provided we hydrophobize the molecule. Anyhow, these emulsions are very interesting because in this particular case, we were using uh, bitumen uh, as well as kerosene oils. But in the case of bitumen oil, the droplet size of the oil was reduced when the emulsification happened. And that meant also that viscosity of the emulsion was reduced. A sheer thinning the, uh, emulsion was produced uh, where you can observe on the right uh, how the viscosity evolved with the shear rate. And that speaks to the fact that very heavy crude oils can be emulsified, producing an emulsion with a relatively low uh, viscosity that allow us to pump, to transport, and to store uh, those emulsions in the case of uh, bitumen crude oils. In the case of kerosene, jet fuels, and uh, diesels, we did similar exercise to produce this type of oil in water emulsions, and we subjected the emulsions to um, combustion. In this particular case, in a single cylinder air cool uh, uh, ignition system. And we found several interesting points. And one of those is that the combustion efficiency was improved and there was a reduction in NOx and SOx. So it's a very practical application for lignin taking advantage of the surface activity. Now, there is, of course, uh, many more aspects of lignin that we need to consider based on the initial uh, discussion that we had related to the chemical makeup of the lignin and the possible interactions of lignin within the lignin molecule and together with also other molecules. And, and that, that applies to proteins, that applies to carbohydrates and to metals. And in all these cases, there is a, a a really large number of possibilities for lignin to be used in, for instance, nanocomposites, in hybrid materials, and also for surface modifications. And in my group, we have studied lignin for those uh, um, opportunities uh, going in different scales from zero dimensions, one dimensions, filaments, and fibers, two dimensional materials, as well as three dimensionals. And I am not going to be able to talk about those of, all of these. So I will stay with the practical formation with lignin as an example of lignin self-assembly into uh, particles or spheres or beads that are shown on the shown in the on the bottom left. So this is something that is already known since quite a, a long time: lignin particle formation. And there are basically two processes: the wet process that has been proposed quite a long time uh, using solvent solvent shifting or pH shift as well as the dry process that, uh, that we proposed uh, actually not too long ago to produce a, a spherical lignin particles. In that process, actually, uh, we follow a very simple scheme. Uh, as you can see here, we take a lignin solution that can be the black liquor or, or, a, or a lignin solution in general, and we use an atomizer and a separator to produce the lignin particles. You see those on the right where we inject the lignin solution together with a gas carrier in a heated tube that goes in a laminar flow system. And because of the surface tension of lignin, they tend to form droplets. Those droplets are dry. And then eventually they become the beads that you see on the right in the SEM and the TEM images that you can uh, appreciate. The beauty of this process is that it's a green process. Doesn't require really solvent. If you use, for instance, black liquors or otherwise, um, and the lignin molecule becoming a nanoparticle or a microparticle can exhibit some properties that are boosted, given the, for instance, antioxidant and UV protection possibilities, as well as the uh, antimicrobial and uh, thermal stabilization of the lignin molecule when these particles are used in given application. There is also, of course, other applications as a mechanical reinforcements in, in, um, in uh, composites as an emulsion stabilizer, in this particular case, as a pickering emulsion stabilizer and as a particular coatings. 
So I will talk a, a little bit about uh, these uh, aspects in, in, in this uh, subject now, keeping in mind that the costs are really competitive. And here in the bottom, you can read a little bit about those calculations that we have made for different types of lignin where the cost can be quite uh, uh, interesting. One aspect of these uh, lignin molecules and the way that we assemble uh, the molecule into spheres or these uh, uh, particles is that depending on the lignin type, that is not only the, the plant species that are used to extract the lignin, but the process itself, whether it's craft, uh, sulfon uh, um, uh, sulfonate or al alkali lignin, or as well, as well as acetylated lignin, you can see the different morphologies, but most importantly, the surface energy that is going to be tuned depending on the process. And that to me opens the possibility, and there are no many like this, opens the opportunity for using lignin, picking lignin from the given process for a given degree of wettability and surface energy as is indicated here from high to low. So pretty much a toolbox of lignin surface chemistries. So more to this uh, process that I indicated the aerosol flow system, I want to indicate this is how it, is, it looks on a, larger, a little bit larger scale. It's a very simple process and the particles that are obtained are very smooth and they are dry. So this is quite important. Now, if we use the, uh, 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 a composition that allows for wrinkling to happen, then it's also possible to create particles of lignin that are not as, as smooth, but are wrinkled. And these are the ones that are shown in the bottom. Now you can imagine how wrinkling can affect the interactions of the molecule, or, or how the wrinkling can affect, for instance, uh, the uh, interaction forces the, the, or, or the role of the molecule or the, uh, in, in fact, the beads in a composite material. So opens many more opportunities if we think about the morphology on the surface of these particles. And this is important because shape matters, not only whether it's a spherical or other shapes, but also the surface corrugation that we have on the particle surface. So we look at the lignin particles as far as the morphology and try to parameterize the uh, morphology on the surface. And for that, we use uh, cryo-electron tomography. And uh, this is an example of the particles going from wrinkled to highly uh, uh, corrugated particles. So they, they can be fine-tuned. And our interest was to look at this uh, morphology of the particles, uh, identifying what we call ridges, vertices, as well as um, the rich network. And trying to compare how the interaction forces of these particles compare with those that are completely smooth. So we look into this, um, uh, we calculated the energy as a function of a distance between a lignin particle and a negative charge surface. And look at the energy um, barrier that you observe in the center depending on the lignin type. And to make a story short, uh, in this uh, diagram that you see on the right, we have the energy barrier versus the distance of separation for the interactions to be measured. And we have the case in the star of a smooth uh, particle, but also you can visualize here that depending where we sit, if the um, particle, the lignin particle is corrugated or wrinkled, then we can also find a stronger or weak, weaker interaction forces. So it is just logical that the colloidal interactions between lignin, lignin beads or lignin uh, particles with other particles or with surfaces can be fine-tuned by the surface corrugation of the material. In another angle about uh, the use of uh, lignin particles, I, I want to bring up this uh, uh, early paper from Orlin Velev in North Carolina that talk about the use of lignin uh, as an antibacterial uh, material. Uh, lignin in itself is antibacterial, but in this particular case, the scorption they, they follow was to infuse the lignin particle with silver ions, and then they found a very interesting antibacterial effect that was uh, uh, e even better than that of the silver, so metal silver particles. So by a simple process of silver infusion in the organic uh, uh, particle, then we obtain super strong antibacterial effects. That's very important. 
And finally, as far as the interfacial activity, um, in the case of the emulsions, earlier I indicated the case of uh, molecular emulsions using uh, lignin as a surface active molecule. But in this particular case, we look into pickering emulsions where the emulsions, emulsions are stabilized by the lignin particles, not at the macromolecule dissolving water. And when we have this type of particle stabilized emulsions, as you may know, then we can achieve very stable emulsions that can be used for many different purposes. So this opens a lot of possibilities for this type of supramolecular assemblies based on lignin. Now, I would like to look back into the coating and I think I have roughly a few minutes left, but uh, I want to, to discuss very briefly about uh, how can lignin be used in the case of coating, surface coatings. So if we take the same particles, you notice that the particles of lignin that we're using in this case are very highly polydispersed. And we try to look how the lignin distribution will happen in a cross section when it is uh, uh, led to, uh, for the water to evaporate, the suspended medium to evaporate, and for the lignin to, to produce a particulate coating. The first thing to say is that depending on the drying rate, we can follow the uh, restructuring of the lignin across the film or the coating layer. And that can be uh, modeled uh, rather easily. And in this particular case, you can appreciate here how the film thickness can or will depend on the drying temperature. So we go from 20, drying the coating at 20 degrees, 110 degrees. You can see by looking at the thickness of the coating that there is a densification at an intermediate uh, uh, temperature or um, uh, drying rate. And that's important because th this opens also other possibilities, thinking about lignin particles to be used in coating applications where we can control the density or the packing of the molecule and, or sorry, the, the, or the density of the particles. And that also speaks to the fact that we can control the transport properties. You can imagine here different transport properties will depend on the drying rate that was used in the production of the coating. Those coatings, of course, can be further utilized and uh, improved if we look into superhydrophobization. So in this particular case that you see here on the left, we use a tile in UV click reaction to uh, graft or to couple the lignin particles with thiol groups that then were functionalized with hydrocarbons to very easily produce very high contact angle, as you can see here on a, 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 when we place a water on, on the surface of the coated layer. So here we have the case of self-cleaning materials that were produced by simple coating of these uh, hydrophobized lignin particles with very little functionalization, then one can achieve super hydrophobicity in this particular case. Now, let me bring nanocellulose back. And uh, here we have been looking into the same particles of lignin, but combined in equo suspension with cellulose nanofibrils. And one thing here that uh, we have been claiming and is also being found by researchers uh, around is the idea of nanocellulose acting as a binder or as adhesive. And this is exactly what we found when we mix cellulose nanofibrils with lignin particles. In the bottom, you can see the morphology of uh, such a mixture. And when we dry the material, the water evaporation produces very high capillary forces and eventually leads to a membrane or a film that is very strong, very cohesive, and can show uh, very interesting properties. For instance, in this particular case, that mixture of uh, cellulose nanofibrils with, um, with the particles of lignin can be used for 3D printing or for creating membranes. And those membranes in the cross section as shown in blue can be used for different properties, uh, radical scavenging, UV shielding, and also anti-fouling uh, against uh, proteins. The concept can be expanded if we fabricate no coatings, but supra particles. So we take uh, the lignin particles and create bigger particles. So for that reason, we call them supra particles, particles of particles, where the cellulose nanofibrils again acts as, act as a glue. 
And in this particular case, we have the situation where these uh, supra particles can be loaded with given uh, bioactive molecules, or for instance, in this particular case, other nanoparticles that can be used for crop protection and fertilization. And the conclusions here, if you want to go to the literature, you can find more details, but the conclusion is really, this is a great opportunity in this area where we want to have a targeted delivery of a given bioactive uh, materials. The beauty of, of, uh, of uh, this type of uh, proposition of supra particles is that the cellulose nanofibrils can manage to bind particles of different sizes. So going from the left to the right, we are changing the particle size from uh, small to bigger ones. And still we can produce this type of supra particles that are very highly cohesive. And in the last example about this uh, supraparticle uh, assembly, we use lignin together with the cellulose nanofibrils to create the supraparticles that you see very clearly on the top. And now we took an extra step and that was to carbonize the supraparticle. And that allow us to keep the particle morphology as such and to produce particles that are relatively large that can be also put in a column so that we can, for instance, uh, do things like CO2 absorption with very high efficiency. So in this particular case, the concept of using particles of particles, small lignin particles embedded in a larger particles by cellulose nanofibrils, producing a system that can be packed in a column and by way of the size of the particles, reducing the, uh, the, the drop uh, pressure the, drop, the, the pressure drop across the column. So allow us to flow gas and to retain given selectively given uh, gases. In this particular case, it was a CO2. I think I'm run, running out of time, but I wanted just uh, as a license slide to talk about the wet um, method to uh, nucleate in lignin particles and very recent work that we published this year shows how this can be done in the presence of cellulose nanofibrils and chitin nanofibrils. And uh, you can find there some very interesting morphologies where the combination of fibrils and lignin particles can be really exploited for a number of applications. Just to end, I only talk about spherical particles, but, but uh, uh, there is uh, still time in the future, hopefully to talk about filaments based on uh, uh, lignin and carbon fibers, two-dimensional structures, as well as aerogels and foams based on lignin, but that's a story for uh, uh, next time. I just want to leave the idea that uh, lignin is an interesting macromolecule. There are many opportunities uh, for uh, bioproducts that we can think about. In this recent review, we look into the economics and the scale of uh, availability of different lignin types, especially, for instance, craft lignin, uh, lignosulfonates and uh, organosulf lignin, but especially compared to the future biorefinery lignins, where we think there is going to be a huge opportunity for lignin to create uh, high value products like those that you see in this uh, diagram, not only from the point of view of uh, energy and biofuels on the right, but valorizing the lignin to the left when we think about emulsion stabilization, UV protection, coatings, and, and uh, composite materials. So final thoughts, um, in most cases, as you could see from the mixture of lignin with cellulose, there is a hint that cellulose containing lignins may show excellent or superior performance in many applications. We don't need to have highly pure lignin. Also crude biorefinery lignins, there are opportunities for valorization, upgrading. This can be, follow, can be following green uh, processes and cost-effective methods. Some of those methods are in the bottom, purification, of course, fractionation, functionalization. And I just discussed today the manufacture of lignin micro and nanoparticles. With that, I end. I hope there is time for questions. And uh, it was my pleasure to share a little bit of my thinking about lignin. Thank you so much. So thank you very much. Uh, Professor Rojas, uh, now we open up for questions. Uh, we so please, if you have any questions, please uh, type them in the Q&A, or if 
you are at YouTube, you can type them in the live chat function.